All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, sometimes we, uh, we tend to go a little long on this, so uh, we'll take the answer as minutes we can. Uh, hopefully you guys are here to learn about security in Drupal. Um, if you're just looking for a place to nap after lunch, uh, that's okay as well. Try that. There we are. All right, so um, my name is Chris Deitzel. I am the uh, founder of Cellar Door Media. Um, we are a, uh, a design and development shop based in Seattle. Um, I've architected e-commerce platforms, enterprise platforms, um, large and small. Uh, and we just launched Locker, uh, which is our first product uh, in the security space uh, about two weeks ago. And so uh, we'll be discussing that. And uh, I'm Luke Probasco, go to Townsend Security. And, uh, I've been working with uh, Chris and Blocker for quite some time, and uh, we also, as kind of security, do a lot of uh, sponsoring of module development uh, in the security space. And I'm David Strauss, uh, co-founder and CTO of Pantheon. Um, I mostly work on platform architecture um, and um, basically keeping our customers safe um, from themselves, from external forces, from other customers, uh, you name it, it's hostile for a lot of them. So we're going to come at this from uh, three different angles. Uh, obviously, uh, David is a platform architect. I'm more of like the Drupal architect. Uh, and Luke um, is more of the security industry aspect. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to give you some insights from different angles uh, to the security approach here. Yeah, and so I, I think that this is a pretty interesting quote, um, that there are only two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that will be again. Even that is merging into one category. Those that have been hacked and will uh, again. I mean, we're just regularly seeing this in the news. And um, I add that um, in a lot of cases, the question is more about what you know you're getting. Um, there are two kind of categories I look at. Uh, one is that people who know that they've been hacked um, and people who don't necessarily know that they've been hacked. Because there's really no way to know with confidence that um, you're completely um, in a perfect situation. Uh, and if you don't have any information about even attempted attacks against you, then you're probably in the latter pack. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think that this is an interesting uh, slide uh, that the Ponymon Institute does a study every year, and on average, it costs an organization $3.79 million per breach, uh, or about $154 per record. And that's not scary enough if you look at how many breaches have happened so far this year, and this is as of uh, October 6th, there have been 591 breaches with uh, over 175 million records exposed. We can have 15 million of that for T-Mobile. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> is this the Pony Institute? Ponymon? Ponymon. So, uh, and these breaches are getting increasingly opportunistic, where uh, what they'll do is they'll often decide that um, they want to um, uh, target any site that has a particular vulnerability in the operating system, uh, in the web server, in the actual content management system, etc. cetera. Uh, and what will happen is they'll have a script. They'll be able to just kind of go through sites using even tools like BuiltWit. Uh, they can get a list of every Drupal site um, that's publicly known on the internet. Uh, and they can pursue um, templated attacks against all of them. Um, in an attack scale that has never been economically feasible before. There's a few open seats over here if you guys want to come in. You're not going to disrupt this by walking in front of us. So, um, all that to say, you will be hacked. Um, let's just all get it out on the table right now. Um, let's not try to, uh, you know, go with the false sense of security or the false sense of oh, we're gonna teach you how not to be hacked. Um, that's not what we're gonna be here to do. We're gonna teach you um, steps that you can take when you are hacked, steps you can take to prevent it, um, and then also uh, mitigate the damage. But, uh, I mean, just a show of hands, how many people have had their credit card uh, number stolen and have been signed up for credit monitoring and such? And, all right, um, so you can tell, you know, with this happens quite often. Um, and uh, a lot of the times we hear, uh, oh, I'm not big enough to worry about that. You know, I have clients that say, oh, I'm, 
you know, just a small shop, I don't have to worry about that. And it's not true at all. That's total, total wishful thinking. Um, in fact, uh, as the FBI, FBI reports, smaller companies are increasingly actually the focus um, of cyber criminals. Um, and John Lanarelli, an FBI uh, consultant, says, and I'll just read this quote here, uh, time and again, I have heard small business owners say they have nothing to worry about because they are too small to interest cyber criminals. Instead, small businesses are exactly who the criminals are targeting for two primary reasons. In the criminal's mind, why go after large companies directly when easier access can be obtained through small business vendor relationships? Secondly, since small businesses have less financial and IT resources, criminals know they are less compromise ready and tend to be less resilient. And we have concrete examples of this happening even on Pantheon where uh, we've had a high profile client website um, where we'll see the accounts, um, try, people try to breach the accounts for that. Uh, and then we'll also see attempts to breach the accounts that are associated with agencies that have worked on the site. Uh, where we'll see a very similar attack pattern against those accounts uh, because they know that if they can get in the back door through an agency or a small business, then it's likely they can escalate that to an attack on the actual site itself. And this is how the, the target hack happened. Um, it wasn't actually target that was breached. Uh, it was a small uh, AC vendor in New Jersey that got breached, which then led them uh, and gave them the keys to the castle to get into target. So um, we'll be talking more about those, uh, those outside connections as well. So um, we're going to take you through a couple of steps. The first one is um, how to build security consciousness. Uh, we need to start thinking about security before we actually start implementing it. Can I ask you a quick question before you go on? Yeah. Uh, what, what seem to be the objectives of the attacks? Uh, is, it, is it primarily like you know, account identities so that they could you know, follow through with um, attacks on individuals? I mean, there are many, many motivations. Uh -huh. um, uh, I can speak to what we've seen on Pantheon. We've seen denial of service attacks all the way up to state level hackers. Uh, we've seen cases where they don't want to breach the site for anything germane to the site itself, but they want to find a place to install phishing software, mm -hmm. um, like a host to put that on, so they'll break into an existing site, go install it on some subdirectory, and then they can target their phishing um, traffic to that website where people fill in the form and it's emailed to them. Uh, they, they may install spam bots. Um, again, not germane to the actual site itself, but taking advantage of kind of free resources. Uh, they may want personally identifiable information or credit card numbers to be able to attempt um, identity theft uh, or aggregate with other identity data that they may have. Um, and um, uh, on here, they often want to use it as a first step to a larger breach, where um, the website is not actually their goal um, either to install phishing software, spam software, or even capture the data directly on the website but they know that the website is on infrastructure that is at least somewhat related to the company. Um, and especially when that's installed, say, in the same data center, it's not properly partitioned by firewall. Um, there have been cases like, say, a Stratfor hack where they uh, compromised the website, then they compromised the server, then they got credentials off the server, and then they compromised every server that the company had, uh, including their email services, which were on totally separate servers, but on the same network. And sometimes it's just script kitties out there just trying to poke holes and, and a lot of the times it's just um, people knocking on doors and all of a sudden one opens up and then they can go start having some fun. So. The opportunistic stuff. Yeah. Um, and then also this kind of idea of it being this kind of festering wound of an attack where um, it's um, to get the foot in the door. Um, this is how the Sony attack happened as well where um, they spent a year building up access to additional systems before um, landing on the mother load which was a shared folder that had a document in it that had all the passwords to the key systems. Um, and they used that to do the fundamental compromise that affected the entire organization. Um, so it wasn't, but it, they came to the front door on a website um, originally for some of the initial parts of the hack. Um, it's just as important as what's not in a typical breach because we don't want to do security theater here. We want to actually prevent real attacks. Um, the chance that your actual modern hashes or encryption will be broken is extremely small. Um, the, uh, the most viable attacks that we've seen, even uh, with the Snowden information from nation state level actors, are that um, they could probably spend 10 to $100 million on a set of computers and break one Diffie Hellman, um, uh, um, I, think it, I think exponent value. Um, or they could um, try and 
create this kind of, they had this um, random number generator that they tried to compromise with the dual with the curve thing. But by and large, the vast majority of encryption that people use is not breakable itself. Um, and uh, even if it is breakable, it would, it's not going to be breakable for less than, say, 10 to $100 billion of investment. And um, that's not what most people need to be worried about. Um, typical vulnerabilities are happening mostly at the combination of the human and engineer perspective. That uh, systems are not designed properly, or users are not following the rules, uh, or are doing dangerous things. And that's how most, most, most breaches happen. Um, and security is also um, a frame of mind. It's not something you can bolt on later. It's not. It's a very bad idea to create a website without uh, security consciousness, and then decide that you're going to throw just like a web application firewall in front of it and a couple other things, and hope that that's going to be um, a uh, a solution for you. Um, you can't just continue to add hardware to the front door. Uh, you have to have a multi-level approach, which means you need to consider the security of every individual system and ask yourself at every point, if system A gets breached, what does that mean for B? And if B gets breached, what does that mean for C? Uh, and you can't do that by just caring about A. Yeah, I, I liken it to uh, perimeter security. You can build the biggest wall you can, you can put the most locks on. We all still have um, vaults or safes in our house for important documents and other things. Our websites are no different. We need to be able to uh, protect the exterior, put up a good surrounding uh, for it, but also uh, see where are we going to keep our, our data and our valuable uh, information safe. We should start calling that approach to the outer wall as like Death Star security. Yeah. You know, where it's like, uh, where, where, where they spend all of this money and time thinking about this external layer and they find one problem with the external <laughs> layer and that just undermines the entire system. Yeah. And I, I also think that. Uh, there's a bit of a responsibility for the Drupal community even to think about security and just to make sure that uh, Drupal can continue to be uh, a viable uh, solution for the enterprise because as far as the enterprise is concerned, they don't really care what the CMS is. They just want to make sure that it is done correctly and secure. Yeah. Yeah, and so... Um, we always try to fall somewhere in the spectrum of, um, and unfortunately, a lot of the developers that we end up talking to um, lie more on the ignorant side. They would rather just put their fingers in their ears and hope that nothing happens to them. Uh, but at the same time, we can't slide all the way to the paranoia level where we're wearing our tinfoil hats and, and locking off everything to our house. Uh, we have to somewhere, we have to sit in this scale of uh, ignorance to paranoia. And it's actually essential for your security that you not go too far into the paranoia direction because one of the things that we've encountered with our client base is that we'll uh, notice that a corporation has implemented almost paranoia level security practices and that just means that people just circumvent them. Um, if you can't, if people can't get their job done with the security systems you have in place, they will just avoid your entire infrastructure. Um, and so, Going too far into paranoia is actually counterproductive. It's also counterproductive because every layer of investment you have is sort of uh, a declining marginal return. That the, um, the initial fact that you want to keep, say, Drupal core patched is probably one of the very first things that you can do that reduces your exposure. Um, and then in terms of how you manage other information on the site, all the other things you can do will keep adding to that. But at a certain point, um, you realize that um, adding additional things um, adds more to the chance that someone's going to kind of defect from your infrastructure and use something else than it does to add actual security to your tools. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about is um, how to practically implement security in ways that definitely move the needle in terms of real attacks um, and generally don't get into people's way. Um, and ideally even um, are an easier path than what people were doing before. Okay, just to change gears here a little bit uh, and get a little audience participation. Who here is working on a project that uh, deals with compliance? All right. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it's often said that uh, compliance is actually the low bar for data security. People are often just focused on meeting a level of compliance when really that's like where they should be starting. Um, but uh, Compliance is also not optional, and uh, <laughs> there there is definitely some uh, modules and services that can help help meet compliance. Um, 
But the other thing I'll just mention here really quick, and I think we can talk about it a little bit more. Uh, a lot of times organizations fall under multiple compliance requirements. So uh, next up, we're going to talk about the CIA triad, not to be confused with the government agency. Uh, stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, confidentiality is roughly equivalent to privacy, and uh, things like encryption are a common method of ensuring uh, confidentiality. Uh, user IDs and passwords also constitute uh, a standard procedure. Of, you can also use two-factor authentication. Uh, it's becoming the norm. And you should you know, generally err on the side of having more confidentiality. The next is uh, integrity. And so to think about this, you have to think that um, we as developers can never trust a user uh, because you don't know who that user is. Uh, you get user input from uh, a certain form or a certain field. Um, you cannot assume that they know what they're doing with that. Um, and, and that's how a lot of the SQL injection attacks occur. Um, and it's also not just about your website, but it's who has read-write access to the servers, who has um, you know, access to your environment, uh, and can you, can you keep the integrity of your environment secure? Mm -hmm. And then finally, there's availability, which um, often doesn't fall in a lot of compliance specs that people look at. Um, like, for example, PCI doesn't care at all about your site actually staying online. They only care about the kind of confidentiality of the data and a little bit of integrity. But uh, there's no purpose to your site if uh, it doesn't actually stay online. And a lot of security is about preventing denial of service attacks, uh, main, uh, making sure that uh, resource utilization, um, even just in a proper sense, a non-security sense, uh, a non-attack sense, uh, doesn't undermine the, um, the uh, uptime of uh, the project. Um, and so what does hacked mean? Um, sometimes it's a defacement like this. Uh, sometimes uh, it's just a denial of service, which can be just as um, uh, costly uh, if you have a, a site that's going down, if your Hulu or Netflix, your, um, your income depends on having it up, uh, your site being up, and then also um, is a data breach, uh, which is the ones that we hear about the most. Um, and those can sometimes be silent, um, but, uh, but a lot of the times it's not these very <laughs> outward facing. I mean, I did have a client that um, called me up after I built the site for him like two years later and like, hey, we got hacked by ISIS. Um, oh, okay. Um, and so, you know, we had to go back and basically scrub the whole site and start over. But um, that's a very rare case. Um, most of the time, it's going to be these uh, these other these other types of hacking. So, uh, as David mentioned earlier, the best way to do this is rather than setting up this giant perimeter approach or a Death Star approach, um, we need to have some sort of layered approach, and, a, and the best comes to a defense and death strategy. So. Um, you have to look at, uh, we, we like to call it from the OS to the JS, like all the way back to the server level, all the way up to um, the browser and what's going on there. Um, you have the device, the application, the computer, the networks, physical, you know, are you monitoring who's coming in and out of the buildings? Because just because your, uh, your site is secure, somebody can walk into your building and start typing away, that's kind of a bad thing. So um, it, it involves much more than just, uh, just your website. And so, you can have um, the strongest Drupal, you can have the most secure environment, but if you have unhardened SSH in the middle, um, you're, you know, it's worthless. Uh, and along with this goes, how many people have had uh, clients say, oh, here's my server credentials, and it's like root and the password, and it's in an email to them. <laughs> yeah, pretty much everyone has. Uh, and I'm like, thank you, we just added scope to the project now, because I have to go back and redo all of this stuff that you just tried to do. Um, and so we've, it, part of it is that we need to teach our clients and our customers and uh, the folks that aren't on our development team about this as well, letting them know best practices, saying, you know, don't email me your root password, that's not a good thing, and here's why. And uh, one of the things is uh, keeping up with the security of these systems because there's no system you can just implement, put on the internet, and let it sit and expect for it to be perfectly secure in perpetuity without further attention. Um, in terms of what I like uh, to keep up with for um, the most relevant security um, news for a kind of Linux-based server infrastructure is um, are, are the things listed here. 
Um, probably the one I read the most is LWN, actually, uh, because they um, uh, do a daily publication of what they think are the top exploits affecting um, major Linux distributions and major software that uh, folks tend to run on Linux. Everything from Apache to PHP to uh, um, to Nginx to the kernel. Um, and then, of course, Drupal security is also critically important. Uh, US CERT is a little more broad. Um, almost every major vendor will send uh, their notifications through that service. So it can be a bit of a fire hose. Um, and uh, of course, um, uh, even just subscribing to some vendors on Twitter um, and uh, performing security-only package updates can um, get you a long way as, as well. Um, a lot of people don't know about the security-only package updates, but on major distributions, you can usually automate a run of the package updates with an option that only upgrades to achieve um, the uh, security fixes that have been published. So it will not do updates that are just for bug fixes or feature improvements. It's just if there's a known vulnerability. Um, so uh, that's an interesting option for people who are worried about having their systems break because of automatic package updates, uh, but also worried about getting security updates out there. And of course, for Drupal, drupal.org slash security um, is going to keep you up to date on all the most recent um, security releases and then uh, lets you access the security team and get to know more about the security within Drupal. Okay, so switching gears here just a tad. Uh, we talked about compliance uh, a little bit earlier, but here, here's a list of some of the, the more major ones, um, ranging from you know, if you're taking credit cards to whether you're a, an educational institution. But one interesting thing, though, is oftentimes organizations fall under multiple compliance requirements. Um, and just for example, if you take a look at a university, we're, we're at a university. Uh, they collect student data, alumni data, donor data. There's a health center, so they take credit credit cards. So right there, that's just you know a few compliance requirements that they need to follow. And I I, uh, I think this next slide here is particularly or, uh, interesting. Um, I'll just read it here. Uh, use of a PCI DSS compliant uh, cloud service provider (CSP) does not result in does not result in PCI DSS compliance for the clients. Uh, the client must still ensure they are using the service in a compliant manner and is also ultimately responsible for the security of their cardholder data. Uh, so I just I think that's particularly um, you should you should make note of that because you have a responsibility of using of keeping your clients secure. Just uh, having a hosting provider have the piece, having the PCI sticker isn't and this means also that um, your hosting provider or platform can never make you directly PCI compliant because you're controlling the software that gets deployed there. Um, ultimately, the merchant is responsible. Um, and this means that um, you basically have to review where you're storing card folder information, where you're processing it, where you're handling it. Um, uh, you can dramatically minimize the amount of compliance you have to do by architecting intelligent using external tools like uh, Recurly or PayPal or Chargeify or a whole litany of ones where you don't actually directly handle the cards uh, will massively reduce the amount of compliance work that you have to do on the site. Um, the very worst is if you have a site where you're not only accepting card holder data through a form, but you're even trying to persist it. Uh, and that just automatically makes you um, uh, having to achieve the highest level of compliance in terms of all the standards you have to do. And um, I've had clients come to me and say, oh, no, I, you know, I'm totally fine with PCI. I'm on Pantheon. So, there you go. Um, or it, you know, it doesn't matter who, where, how. It's how you implement it. Um, I've also, you got, you got to be careful because um, I had to train one of my clients on the fact that a web form is not capable, <laughs> it should not be used to collect credit card data. Um, just because you give them these beautiful tools that allow them to do fun things, um, you still have to train them about some of these regulations and what to do around them. And uh, oh, sorry. so, um, I, I, I like this slide as well um, because personally identifiable information is not just a credit card or a social security number. Uh, some, some interesting items include uh, your IP address, um, maybe your, your just even your name. Um, this can really make it easy for people to piece together an identity. 
And if, if you think about it, a lot of people, well, I'm sure a lot of you here, collect this sort of information on these <laughs> marketing sites even. Well, that stuff all needs to be protected. Mm -hmm. And part of why it needs to be protected is that you can piece together someone's identity with uh, various pieces of PII, um, even if um, you're not the only, uh, even if you're not providing the complete picture yourself, uh, you can uh, you have responsibility because you can help this identity get pieced together. So um, partly because it's after lunch and partly because it's fun to do audience participation. Uh, uh, if everyone can stand up, we're going to do like a little bit of a segmentation exercise um, so that we can see um, um, where <laughs> the blood flow. Narrow down. <laughs> okay, so. Um, uh, a lot of people can sit down really quickly. This, I mean, the first one is sit down if you have a Mac. <laughs> um, and uh, second, um, sit down if uh, you are um, if you live in California. Um, and finally, um, uh, sit down if you're. Um, yeah, okay, I'll just do this one. Sit down if you were not born in February. February 26th, so. So you can see in a room like this, with information that we could get from Facebook, we would know one person out of the entire room. Um, seemingly innocuous data around, you know, are you connecting with a Mac or a PC? Do you um, celebrate certain holidays? Do you post certain things on your Facebook? Um, all of this can be pieced together to get at you without you thinking about it. So, and then that can be used um, to do um, kind of uh, attacks um, that are related to um, social engineering, where they can call up your credit card company, they can call up your insurance provider, um, and whether the goal is ultimately to exploit your information there or to piece together more pieces of your identity, the chance they'll be able to answer questions about you, the chance they'll be able to build confidence in the service person that they're talking to, that they are you, um, uh, or someone else, um, goes way up the more information they're able to collect and um, pull together confidently about an individual. And this happened um, a third time ago, but uh, one of the editors for Wired um, had his uh, identity breached uh, because he had a very short Twitter handle and somebody just wanted to gain control of his Twitter handle. So what they did is they called up Amazon uh, and Amazon, they were going through the questions with the customer service agent and they said, well, can you tell us the um, last four digits of the social card or social security number or whatever, something associated with card that ends in one, two, three, four. And the person's like, uh, 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 okay, sorry. Hangs up, calls Apple, and Apple's like, can you give us the last four digits of your credit card that you use to register for the Apple store? And it's like, ah, oh, one, two, three, four. And Perfect. They reset his password, they sent him a new email, uh, and they were able to get in. And so um, we also have to think about this from an implementation standpoint of what are we asking people, um, and can we make sure that what we're asking them is not easily found somewhere? Um, would you just, the scenario you just described is somebody, a very targeted individual, but say on, on Facebook, mm -hmm. um, have there been instances where people are using the APIs? Perhaps to just go harvest stuff uh, on a systematic basis. Mm -hmm. um, but how is that happening? Uh, how is that happening? Very um, on Facebook. Well, they, um, they, so if you log in with an application, uh, the application can request authorization to get certain information. Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook has really clamped down on how much uh, they disclose um, in the last couple of years. It used to be you get pretty much the entire profile. These days, you can mostly just get the friends that they have and. Um, I think you can get basically their birthday and current city. Um, so um, it's still disclosing some information, um, but I'll actually make the case that I think social logging is a good thing overall um, for reasons that we'll get into in a minute. So um, first, we're going to kind of step into some of these um, essential security practices, what we, uh, we like to call them. And if you're not already doing this, um, just go start making backups. Um, Node Squirrel, which is uh, now provided by Pantheon, um, is completely free. Start using it right now. Um, if you have another backup system, great. I always like to uh, tell the story of um, I had a uh, I was doing a 6 a.m. feeding with my my newborn son, um, and I get I see an email. I'm checking my emails, and I see an email from a client. It's like I just screwed something up on the website. I don't know what I did. Is there anything you can do about it? I'm sitting here with a newborn in my hands. I pull out my phone. 
and within about two minutes, I had restored it back up uh, from that morning onto the, onto the site, wiped the whole thing clean, cleared the caches, and we were ready to go, all while still uh, bottle feeding my son. So um, if you have backups, it makes your life that much better. Um, so please, please, please uh, start using backups. The next one is version control. Um, again, we should all, these should seem like uh, standard practices, but not everyone's using them. Um, if you're using something like Git, the reason why you want to use it is because you can go onto your server, uh, run Git status, and see if any files have changed. Um, so you immediately have an update of, has somebody tampered with a file here? You can see which files have been tampered. Um, you can see, you know, um, all the way down to the permissions on the file and, and if those have been tampered with as well. Um, and it's a great tool to not only deploy your code, but also make sure that you have some sort of awareness of what's going on. Um, and uh, I think one of the most important advancements in the last five, ten years is around federated identity, where um, instead of signing in with a user password uh, pair everywhere, where people often reuse the same password over and over and over again, um, we now have options to do federated identity, where uh, people set accounts on key services that have high levels of account security, and those are used um, to provide logins to most other systems. Um, on the social side, you have Facebook, Twitter, Google+, um, GitHub, uh, Microsoft provides a single sign-on for their kind of Windows Live accounts. Uh, and in each of those cases, those companies are doing, uh, have entire teams that are dedicated to account security, that are looking for login anomalies, they're looking for a geographic um, locale of login, uh, whether um, to trigger two-factor authentication for a user, um, and um, basically doing a whole bunch that you can't just do as a single site owner. Some of it is done in aggregate, where they'll notice that one origin is trying to attack a whole bunch of different accounts across their infrastructure, not something you can necessarily know as an individual site owner. Um, so while there are some concerns that you should have about um, personally identifiable information being disclosed as a user of some of these signing tools. As a site owner, there's um, not much harm in offering as primary sign-up and sign-on options kind of login with Facebook, login with Google, and you can choose to not request PII from the user. You can basically just get their email address verified by the service. Um, and um, this is a great example of security that um, actually makes the experience easier for the end user. Instead of telling them to set up an account, choose a password, verify their email, um, you've made a one-click sign-in option that, that also allows <coughs> you to capture a password. Um, one of the kind of um, drums I like to beat with security is that the best way to ensure that you don't disclose information is to not capture it and to not handle it. Um, and so by not requesting a user, uh, the user set passwords, you are not making yourself a vector for um, um, capturing passwords that people are reusing. Because even if you have a, an, a perfect caching scheme for the passwords, someone may be able to compromise the site and set it where they can divert the password information and capture it in a way before it's hatched as people are logging in. And if those are the same passwords they're using on other sites, and statistically they will be, uh, then you are now a vector for helping compromise other sites. Yes? Does Pantheon use federated logins now? We do. Uh, we offer enterprise federated login. Um, we have on our roadmap to do the social log. Gotcha. Um, the um, on the other half of this, on the right side of the slide, you can see the enterprise options, and these enterprise options are important for organizations and agencies, uh, where uh, what you can do is instead of having people set up accounts everywhere, you can set up um, single sign-on through things like Active Directory Federation services, SAML. Um, Shibboleth is popular in universities. Um, there are providers that um, can do this for an organization, like Okta and OneLogin, where um, they provide as a service kind of identity for an organization, and that way people only have one place to set their password, one place their passwords are getting checked, one place that they have to do extra two-factor authentication to reduce two-factor fatigue. Like, I couldn't imagine what it would be like for me to track every single site with like a Google Authenticator style second factor. I would have a million accounts on my phone that I'd have to pull out. Um, and um, the added advantage to this is it substantially reduces the chance of phishing attacks because you are uh, not encouraging users to just put their password into um, uh, a litany of different um, forms. Like, the more that they can expect a single URL to log into and a single place that they put in their password, the less likely it is that someone can trick them into putting their password in elsewhere. Um, and 
this is particularly important for corporations because um, if uh, you want to be able to revoke accounts for people who have left the organization um, and you want to be able to track where people are um, actually logging into from an auditability perspective. Um, uh, and and, and um, barring you know the single sign-on stuff, or with your main identity provider, uh, you need to use secure passwords. Uh, this is pretty well known. You want to use um, uh, a different password for every site, so that when one site is compromised, it doesn't compromise your identities on a whole bunch of sites. Uh, encourage your users to do this, um, and uh, do this yourself. Um, on, on the left, you can see the kind of uh, well-known XKCD about putting insane password complexity requirements where you don't just require that someone basically mash on the keyboard um, uh, because that's not something someone will necessarily remember um, and it doesn't necessarily improve the entropy of the password anyway. So um, I, I can put a big plug in for 1Password. Um, I use it and I, my list is now like 60 or 70 sites that I have to log into for different clients and different um, sites I go to. Um, I know none of those passwords anymore, yeah. which is awesome. Um, and the best password that you can't get compromised is the one you don't know. Um, I said it. The, the one annoying thing, and I will, I will um, say this from a, as a developer, we need to do this more, is let's not put dumb requirements on our passwords. Like, it must be six to eight characters. If somebody wants to put in a 30-character password, have that go for it. Um, and so uh, and I find that a lot when I'm using 1Password because mine's set to be like 27 characters with various symbols and stuff, and I hit go, and it comes back with an error, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, you, you don't want me to use that secure of a password, so. Um, and yeah, I'll just add one more thing, because I, 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 I heard about this recently on a, a podcast I listened to. There are still sites out there that don't allow you to copy and paste. Like, that's essential for these password managers. <laughs> so yeah. make sure you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, ideally, encourage users to kind of federate so they don't set passwords. And if you allow them to set passwords, uh, then don't put owner's requirements on it. Um, also, if you have to use a password, a second factor of authentication is good because it guarantees that it's something you don't know. Um, the, um, there are various levels um, of second factor authentication. Uh, I'm starting to have some doubts about the, um, the second factorness of Google Authenticator style because you can now scan it into things like 1Password and um, into things like Authy and sync it to your desktop and it's not necessarily stored in a different place. Uh, but it's still far better than just allowing people to set passwords uh, because at worst, it's a password that you are setting for the user which is guaranteed to have some decent level of entropy and uniqueness. Um, the, of, of course, set it where it's available on accounts, like um, on you know, GitHub, on Google, on Facebook. Um, uh, use their two-factor authentication capability. And um, one of the things we have to start realizing as we're building the sites that we do is that we're not alone. We're just a small gear in the cog of a giant machine, right? And so, um, we're, we're building a, a marketing site. Well, that marketing site uh, is talking to um, MailChimp. It may be doing some sort of credit card processing to sign up for something. Uh, it may be doing internal stuff within the organization that it needs to uh, communicate with. So your site, though it may seem small and insignificant, is actually um, a vector for a much larger attack like we've been talking about. And so uh, we start thinking about how do we um, how do we handle our API connections, not just our passwords and our data and encrypting and whatnot. We also not need to start thinking about, uh, am I protecting my connection out to MailChimp? If someone has my MailChimp password, they can send an email with my logo on it to anyone they want, and that's not a good thing as a brand. And I've mentioned this uh, a little bit before, but you're in an ecosystem uh, with these passwords, and uh, people are not setting passwords uh, on your site in any kind of vacuum, and it's. Uh, a breach of the passwords on your site makes it more likely that another site is compromised. And even if you have perfect handling of passwords on your site, um, another site could get breached, and uh, they, they could be breached and have the same passwords that people are using on your site. Uh, so uh, there's a whole set of um, kind of ecosystem level concerns here about um, what the impacts of your security choices have on other people and vice versa. So um, if you don't, like Dave was saying earlier, if you don't need it, hands off. Um, the best way to defend yourself against leaking PII um, is just not touching in the first place. 
And so it won't be in your logs, it won't be in your database, it won't be in your code. Um, all of these payment providers um, provide methods now which um, are great because they not only reduce the scope of uh, PCI compliance you have to adhere to, uh, but they also do direct post models so that when the customer enters their credit card data and hits go, um, it posts directly to them. Um, they handle it and then they give you back a token which you use to authenticate uh, the transaction with. And it's a wonderful model and you can go from, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of PCI um, liability and, and complexity around getting um, audited and certified down to a very easy um, self-audit process that you can do for SIT. Yeah. I would also add Braintree. Braintree, okay. correct. Braintree is part of PayPal. Is it? Yes. It's, it is a subsidiary of PayPal trying to be not PayPal, but PayPal. <laughs> so, um, Also with key management, like I was talking about earlier, um, this is just a small um, scattering of, of modules and uh, information that uh, we may or may not use um, in building our websites. So uh, the big ones, authorized.net, uh, FedEx, uh, MailChimp, all of these, if you have um, connections that you have to make to them from your website, you need to be protecting that, uh, that information. I, I know, uh, for instance, uh, there's one integration that I've built where um, it was for a payment provider and they actually required you to use a username and password and that happened to be the same username and password that you log into your merchant account with. Uh, and so that data is now stored with the site and because of that, um, you can log into the merchant account if you have um, the credentials from that site. So um, let's protect our API keys and make sure we handle those well. <coughs> so now we're gonna go into um, more of uh, kind of securing the stack and um, around your server level security. So um, well, it's important to um, make sure that the set of responsibilities is mapped um, reasonably for each layer of the stack. Um, it's very easy to set up a system where um, some of the lowest levels are taking responsibility for, some of the highest levels are taking responsibility for, and some of the middle ones are kind of a question mark. Like, if you set up um, servers with Rackspace or on the Rackspace cloud or on the Amazon cloud, um, you know they're taking care of the network, you know they're taking care of the, um, the backbone, the power, things like that. Um, they might even be taking care of the OS for doing um, like kernel updates for you. Who's taking care of Apache, MySQL? Like, you can definitely tell Rackspace to do that, um, but if you also install Varnish on the box and Solar on the box and other things, then they may not take responsibility for those applications, nor are they really part of the actual site code themselves. Uh, and so you want to kind of map out the whole stack that you're using and understand which parts are being taken care of by whom. Um, this is one thing to add is how many um, developers or dev shops here run their own hosting for their clients or have their own servers that they manage? Is anyone? Quite a bit. Um, is that something that you guys do out of necessity or out of ease? Because um, I, when I was uh, looking at my clients and, and the projects that I was working on, I started realizing I'm a developer. I'm not a hosting provider. Um, I don't like sitting on a beeper. I don't want to manage the the uh, stack, and I don't want to be liable for what happens if um, that server is is breached. And so um, I made the decision to move myself completely out of the hosting business and let people who actually do hosting for their business uh, handle that because I'm not going to be as good as they are. Um, and I think that's something that we need to be real with as developers and as development shops is to say, um, what is our core competency? Is it gonna be hosting? Great, do a great job at hosting and make sure you have a, a secure stack. If not, be honest with your clients and say, look, I don't wanna host your site for you. You need to go to X, Y, and Z provider and get the site and then I'll work with that. Another case is um, uh, what I was talking about earlier about the idea of a festering attack where um, something may be a breach of a website or even a marketing site that's very basic. Uh, but if it's co-located in the same um, rack as the other servers, um, even if you sometimes think they're firewalled, they might not be as firewalled as you might think. Um, and uh, it's possible if they're managed by the same people for some of the credentials to be kind of scattered on those systems. Um, I don't know the exact case of what they harvested off the web server in Stratford's situation to be able to compromise the mail server, but uh, they certainly, um, oh, we're not on the slide. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, but uh, 
just I, it's, in, uh, it's essential that um, the outer parts of the system not be um, a leaking um, spot to compromise other parts. Uh, and one of the best things you can do is to segment some of the responsibilities of those things, uh, even segment the physical location of some of those things. Um, there's just no reason to run like an exchange server on the same rack as your website. Um, you're basically the only thing separating them is at best a firewall that you put this computer properly. <coughs> well, well um, for people who do, um, in the case, um, I think Stratford was running exchange, uh, just using it as an example. Uh, or in the case of Sony, like they got into some of the Active Directory systems uh, because um, I think that they were using, I was just saying that work, yeah. And we're running short on time here, so we're yeah. going to cruise through some of these okay. Um, so uh, you also have to secure your OS. Um, you need to make sure that you're managing your configuration, detecting anomalies in configuration, using the security tools that your OS vendor is providing for you, like firewalls, um, secure remote authentication and administration. Um, and like I was saying before, the difference between you knowing whether you've been attacked or not, um, sometimes comes down to being able to detect compromise um, using things like rootkit detection to tackle verification. Do you recommend something in the realm of rootkit um, there are a number of open source ones on the website. Uh, we actually focus more on package verification with Pantheon uh, because that's more of a kind of, uh, rather than detecting the signs of a problem, we look for completeness of the secure implementation. So we ha package all of our code to our PMs, we put it to YUM repositories, we sign um, the packages, uh, we distribute them to the systems, and package verification verifies that all the files on disk and the, and the config, stock configuration all matches the hashes and timestamps that were shipped with the package. So you have a complete cryptographic trust chain all the way to the software that's running the system. There's a server in China that you could download those from. It'd probably be a lot faster. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, the cryptographic chain is important. Um, it's, it's not about, I mean, I know you're talking about the Xcode thing. Uh, but it's not about necessarily, um, uh, you can't do all of it by visual inspection. Um, you really have to have um, systems watching your back that are verifying every byte of the information you're working with, every byte of the software that's running on your systems. Uh, because visual inspection is just never going to be able to achieve the scope of things that can, uh, be able to inspect the scope of things that can change. Um, and then now we get into Nginx and Apache, which is your application server. Um, there are certain headers you can add to pages that, that minimize the chance of exploitation. Um, the kind of like X-frame options, um, using HTTP only cookies. Uh, uh, this is all a defense in depth thing for running your site because uh, what that does is that um, you're always uh, possibly vulnerable to having cross-site request forgery and cross-site scripting, but uh, by using things like the X-frame options and HTTP only cookies, you actually vastly minimize the chance that even getting one of those breaches is able to result in a larger breach. Uh, and then your database, um, I think some of these are reasonably obvious. Uh, change your default password, lock down access to required hosts, um, secure your backups. Um, um, in securing your backups, it's really important that uh, you not just have lots of PII that goes into the database dumps that then get loaded onto developer laptops that are then not encrypted and going to every convention that people can lose them at. No. Uh, because uh, <laughs> you either need to ha not put the data onto your laptops and try to work with it mostly on the servers, uh, or you need to have a comprehensive information security policy or approach to what you have on the machines and how those machines are configured. Because uh, you're very much treading into weakest link territory by putting lots of critical information on machines and phones that you're carrying every day. And one of the things that we need to do as a Drupal community is look at what we're storing in the database. Um, we'll talk about this in a minute here. Uh, but the, the data that's in your database, uh, sometimes people think, oh, I'm using Form API and I've used the password field and I get those pretty little dots when I enter in my, my information. But what they don't realize is once that information goes into the back end, it's still in plain text. It's still clear. The password field does nothing other than mask what they're inputting. And so um, there are almost all the modules uh, that I've looked at uh, don't have 
any form of you know password obfuscation or anything like that. Um, a perfect example is the SMTP module actually stores the, the password and the email address in the same record in the database right next to each other. Um, somebody gets your, your database and now they can log into your, um, your email server um, purely through that. So um, as developers, we need to start thinking about when we build modules or we're maintaining them, um, what are we doing with the information that we're collecting and where are we storing that? Uh, are we storing it in the database, on the server, in files? Can we split it up? Can we do multiple approaches? Can we you know, integrate with some sort of um, off-site management? Like, there's a whole bunch of different things that we, we can do, uh, but we need to start looking at it as a, as a holistic approach. Um, and also, just you know, there's a few modules here listed, but um, it, just one thing I want to note is uh, many compliance regulations say that if you have properly encrypted data and you do have a breach, you are not financially responsible to, for a breach notification. So and it's just another point. Like if you have to collect it, make sure it's protected. And sometimes um, I love this um, policy that they're they're starting to put in. It's in HIPAA, and it's actually um, going to be implemented in the EU here pretty soon. Uh, it's a Safe Harbor Act, and it says. If you are properly encrypting and managing your keys um, and your database or is breached or the data is lost, you don't have to notify the public uh, because you can, you, if you can provably show that you're doing it right, um, then you're relatively safe to say that the data that they got is of uh, no value. And so um, I think that that uh, is a great way to incentivize businesses of, hey, if I just take these extra three or four steps, I'm not gonna have to be drugged through the mud when my, my data is breached. And so um, part of uh, encryption is also key management and what do you do with the keys? Because um, if, if you're taking that key, like I was talking about with the database, if you're taking that key and storing it in the database that you used to encrypt your, your data, it's useless because somebody just grabs that key and, and it decrypts the data. Yeah, so don't take, don't take your key to the front door. That's essentially yeah. what I'm saying. Uh, and there are compliance regulations like PCI and FISMA require proper key management. And um, there are standards and best practices uh, by the, and the National Institute of Standards and Technology. NIST uh, defines them and uh, just work as a security company. Uh, key management is fundamental to a defense in depth uh, security strategy. Um, like I was talking about earlier, we need to start protecting API keys as well. Um, don't share your API keys with uh, people who don't need to have access to them. Um, you know, use a production and development key so that, uh, and again, how many developers um, have sent the, oops, I just sent a, a, a test email to the entire uh, production list. Um, I know. Um, <laughs> We were with uh, Verizon and uh, their app just did that uh, two days ago. It sent out test as a push notification to the entire like six million user base that uh, they're using the app. Uh, and it was really funny to watch Twitter react to that. But um, <laughs> segment your keys. Make sure that you have a production and a, and a um, development key so that you can tell all your developers, hey, use this, and you know that it's going to absolutely nowhere. Uh, and then you keep that, that production key um, locked down. And so, um, because key management is so critical, um, we uh, came out with Locker. Um, it's, uh, this is new, it's in beta right now. Um, it's exclusively on Pantheon, so you can go take a try. Uh, it's free for development, always will be. And the idea here is that um, we're trying to make offsite key management easy. So um, simple plug-in with the, the module for Drupal. Um, we use the key module, which um, we're pushing as kind of a best practices in the community in general. Um, and this just plugs into the key module and offers key a way to store um, all of the keys off-site in our hosted environment, which is secured and uh, locked down for you, so you don't have to worry about managing your, your own key manager. Can you, um, can you enforce key rotation? Like every three months, you gotta regenerate your key. We're, yeah, so we're looking at doing um, advanced stuff like that so we can do key rotations. Um, at the heart of Locker is an actual key manager, uh, and so it has the ability to, to start doing that. Um, we're even looking at doing systems where uh, you enter into key, you're like, I don't want to know my key, just create one for me, um, and the system can create a, a secure uh, encryption key for you and do, do various things like that. Um, one of the nice things because of the integration with Pantheon is we know the site uh, variables um, along with it, so we not only know what your site is, but where your site is, and so we actually do the segmentation of development and production for you. Um, and so your production key is stored with the production label on it so that we know that only your production environment can get it. Um, and then you cannot get the development environment uh, or the production uh, key in the development environment 
Um, the beautiful thing for this in Drupal is that it just stores the machine name um, at, the, at the Drupal level. So your code flows in and out of production totally fine. You don't have to go and manually set anything. Um, the system just knows which key you want to have. And if you're deploying manually to systems like um, Amazon Web Services, they have their own key management service. Uh, there are various other solutions that are either installable or part of other platforms. Um, and I believe that Locker will eventually be launching on other, uh, support other Drupal platforms as well. Correct. And we're also working on WordPress now, too. And for, um, I just got to give down the security a little bit of a plug here. We do have a, a key manager that can be dedicated to your organization. So you can then, uh, if you don't want anyone else to control your keys, you want to keep that internal, that's something that you can do. And then you also have the tools that can help you manage the keys. All right, I think we're, uh, We've got five minutes left in time. Um, these next couple slides are, are pretty generic. Keep Drupal core updated. If you see a security release, do it. Don't ask why. Um, and <laughs> just, yeah, why? Uh, obey. Just, just, just obey. Uh, just because a module is on D.0 does not make it secure. Um, there, so it, though it, there is a great uh, process that the security team goes through to help manage uh, module security, um, it's not perfect. So just because it's on there doesn't mean it's safe. Always look through it. Um, there are certain developers that I trust, and so if I go to a new module and I see that it's by them, it's like, done. I know that they're going to be doing things right. Um, and so make sure you know who's building it, how many updates has it had, where was it, in, or how many installs does it have. Those are all things that you want to look at. Um, and then finally, secure your team. Make sure you, like we were talking earlier, uh, two-factor authentication, um, you know, <coughs> all, these, uh, all these are good ways to secure physically the personnel in your team as well. Um, we have one last session, which is uh, the or section, which is the real world, but um, do you want to just open it up for questions? And uh, let's just do the Drupal Drupal Giving slide. Okay, yeah. I just want to say this. Okay, so um, we did some analysis when um, the attack was first released, where we basically put a monitor in place that would detect attempts against um, the pattern of attack that we expected. It was only seven hours before uh, there were automated attacks that we were seeing pervasively used across, uh, um, attempted across Pantheon sites um, for the Drupal getting attack. It's critical that uh, for major vulnerabilities that you have an infrastructure in place to quickly test and um, deploy. Uh, one thing that Drupal does to try to make your job easy uh, is that uh, when there's a combination of bug fix, feature, and security um, fixes that are about to go out, we always do a release that is just the security fixes first, and then we do an immediate follow-on release, maybe minutes later, that includes the security fix plus the bug and uh, feature uh, things. So we always provide a version that you can go to that is um, just like just the security immediate stuff you need to deploy. And when that, that comes out and you, and you have a complicated site, we recommend just deploy the security release right now and then send the, the second release through more QA because it will include the security and the bug fix stuff. So um, we, we'll put the slides up online. Um, we've got some slides here uh, just with data around uh, SSH attacks on Pantheon. Um, what they've done around, uh, there's also uh, being able to watch uh, targeted DDoS um, and, uh, and instances there. So, but I, I want to, we've got a fairly good crowd here and I want to make sure we open up some time for <coughs> questions. We only got a couple minutes left, so yeah. Uh, in, in terms of uh, models or the in there, is there anything uh, model uh, contributed that you can add to you know, the simple factor of um, there is a 2FA module for Drupal um, that is available, uh, and there's also 2FA modules that um, are out for, like Google Authenticate, I believe, has a 2FA module. Uh, yes. Um, and so uh, there are ones that you can use to do that, but then um, there are also, um, I think you can you can put it into your, um, your module that you're I also for. encourage looking, instead of the federation options, where if it's a site that's mostly for corporate users, look at using something like Samuel to log into the site, uh, and if it's mostly for public users, then look at social login, where they can click, do one click to come from Google or Facebook or Twitter, et cetera. Um, there are models to do that. There are services that can help you do that, like January and Auth0 to provide that kind of infrastructure. Um, and then people are welcome to set up 2FA on uh, the service they're logging in from. 
um, and they don't have to set a password on your site or try to get additional like Google Authenticator, if you replace your phone, you have to reset that one every second. It's a kind of a Any other questions? Yes. Uh, well, on the conference site, I believe yeah, I believe we'll be able to put them onto the conference site, um, and then we'll also um, we'll tweet out that as well. Yeah, at a minimum, we can put a URL on our um, conference description that has the. Yeah. Maybe you could talk a little bit about you know, apart from what you mentioned, just how does the department a little bit more like security of module and just some other things you recommend best practices. So. Um, there's there's a, a great module out there called Paranoia. Um, if you're really uh, concerned about things, um, it can throw some some things into the mix. Um, but uh, it, it actually does a really good job because it turns off the PHP filter um, and doesn't let it be turned back on. Um, and it actually prevents itself from being disabled as a module. Um, and so um, that's one of the, the main vulnerabilities in Drupal is if somebody can somehow get into your site either through a SQL injection or a, a weak password, they enable the PHP filter and they're off to the races. So uh, anything you can do to lock down that is, is good. Another, um, there's a distribution called Garter, um, G-A-U-R-D-R, um, and it has a bunch of security-minded modules uh, deployed with it as well. And also, uh, um, so, this is available uh, by default on Pantheon, but it's also available in the preferred module space. Uh, the site audit module that my company maintains, um, that looks for a lot of performance best practices, but it also looks for a lot of security best practices. So it'll mention, that'll also play the PHP filters on, if the develop module's enabled, if use UI is enabled, um, and a lot of the things that help performance also help reduce security surface area. So having fewer modules enabled um, means there are fewer things to possibly exploit on site. Yep, so that's all the time we have. Um, if you guys uh, want to stick around and talk, we'll be probably up in the exhibit hall. You can find us, uh, find us tonight at the party. Um, we'd love to talk more with you guys. So thank you. Thank you.